Hello. Wow, it's very exciting to be here. It's amazing. So my name's Catherine Powell, and I have been meditating pretty much every day for about 17 years now. So I'd really like to start this talk with just a one-minute meditation with all of you. So if you just have a look around you, just take in the safety of your environment. Take a look to the people to your left, to your right. And then I'd like you to just close your eyes. And just take in the sounds. Feel the ground under your feet, this Welsh earth. And take a few slightly deeper breaths, just bringing your awareness home to yourself. Notice your body, your emotional state. And just allowing yourself to rest into your breath. So I'm here to talk at the Do Lectures about my work with the London Meditation Project and a project that we founded over the last couple of years in particular which is working with combat veterans, with homecoming service people and with their families. So it's all very well isn't it, meditating in a beautiful mountainous, quiet, beautiful, peaceful area of Wales. How does that translate? for people who are in combat and people who've come home from combat zones. So I'm going to try and talk to you about that in the next 20 minutes. Um, there are three things that I'd really like to say. One thing is I'd like to express something to you of the connection between civilians and veterans, civilians and our service people. The human connection. How many people, are there, are there any veterans in the audience, just to, just to know, any ex-service people here? Anyone with brothers or sisters currently serving? Anyone whose father served or grandfather? Yeah, it starts to get more and more, so it's never that far away. The second thing I want to talk about is the value of meditation and how can that be of, of help to people whose lives have been changed by experience of war. And the third thing I want to talk about is the potential and the possibility of growth of transformation that can, can come through traumatic experiences. So, so the first thing is connection. So for me, this project came out of my meditation practice. We do a, a practice in the Buddhist tradition called the loving kindness practice, the metta bhavana. And in the, the stages of that practice, we go through reflecting on developing loving kindness towards ourselves, a good friend, a stranger, an enemy, and then in the final stage, we just embrace as much of the world as we possibly can, wishing for safety, for well-being, for kindness in the lives of all beings everywhere. So I was sitting practicing this meditation in a, a similar to this in a way, but there were lots of children running around too, a family-friendly retreat in Devon. And in the final stage of that meditation, I just found my heart was filled with, my, my mind was filled with images of soldiers very strong, uh, young men, young women in different countries whose lives were in danger, who were maybe exhausted, living under very difficult conditions. And it just kept coming back in that meditation. I felt a very strong connection to them. And I wanted to do something about it, not just 
may they be well, may they be happy and opening my heart to them, but is there some way that I can reach out to them? So I do feel quite strongly as a civilian that we have a responsibility towards our service people. I should say at the beginning that I'm basically anti-war. You know, um, when there was the marches against the war, I was the first person to, to sew a huge banner using my fashion textiles history that said Buddhists for peace. Um, but it's become a much more complex uh, awareness for me over the last few years. I've learned a lot more about it. So, where can I start? I started looking into what was already available for soldiers. Oh yes, let me show you some pictures. You may not be aware, where's the thing? You may not be aware, um, that's us, that's our peace of mind project. You may not be aware that there are already <coughs> soldiers serving in all the forces, um, the Navy, the Army and the RAF, who are already meditating whilst serving and, and trying to practice a mindful way of being. It's extremely challenging. I'll read you an email in a minute from, from one of them. Um, last year, I had the privilege to go to the Buddhist Conference of the Armed Forces, the Armed Forces Buddhist Society Conference. This here is Sunil. Sunil is the one and only Buddhist chaplain in the British Armed Forces. And so meditation is already there. I talked to Sunil about coming to here. He said, don't worry, tell the truth, it'll be fine. I was really nervous. Um, Sunil uh, has a, a great faith which I share in the innate goodness of human beings. And our service people and those who've served over years, years and years and years of warfare, they don't have the choices the rest of us have in the moment to be peaceful and non-violent. They're up against situations that we can't possibly know how our own mind would respond and what we would do under those conditions. So, yes, just to say something about, we need, we need to suspend our judgment about the behavior of our forces and to recognize how uh, war is created by all of us. This is, you can, you can all disagree with this, but this has been my reflection of it. If you imagine that war is, is the hitting point of a huge, momentum of cultural norms you know how many of us drive a car we might not think we were connected to war but you know how many of our lives are dependent in some degree on oil for example so and there's a whole load of racism hatred suspicion fear aggression that builds up in countries and it comes to a head and those young men and women are out front they are dealing with it i don't know why we think this can possibly work how are these young people at the front with a gun can possibly like change the massive wave that pushed them up there, but somehow governments still haven't seemed to learn a different way of talking to each other. So they go through a lot. There are things that can happen in the war. Uh, people lose things, they lose their best friends, they lose limbs, they lose abilities, they may lose hearing, they may lose their sight, they lose their innocence. They lose that thing that maybe led them to join the military. Not all of them, but quite a lot of veterans I've spoken to, you know, the reasons they joined the military have really changed. Um, they also bring something back. Hello. They bring back nightmares, they bring back memories of things that no human being should ever have to see. They bring back fear, they bring back hypervigilance. So they're expected to be alert all the time when they're serving. They come back and you know, I've, I've sat and meditated with veterans who any sound that they hear outside the space, they feel it's their job immediately to identify and, and, and to determine is that a threat. You know, if the lights flicker, whoa, it's a big thing. So people come back with very, very altered senses from war. Not everyone, but some, quite a number. It does transform the life of everyone, I believe, war. So we need to welcome them home. So I've done quite a lot of research and, and some of the things I've found that have helped me forward with working with veterans have come from the States. So first of all, uh, I met a veteran on a three and a half week solitary retreat I did in the Rocky Mountains um, in Colorado who was a Vietnam veteran. And I asked him, I said, you know, I'm a civilian woman. I've never served. Is there anything that I can offer? I, I, would it help? Would it help for veterans to, to have something to do with meditation. 
And he just said to me, um, if you can help people forgive themselves for what they've done, you should do that. Now that's a particularly v Vietnam veteran take, I believe, because as I've gone on, I feel that a lot of it is that our soldiers need to be able to forgive the societies that sent them out there. But also Vietnam veterans, with their understanding of loss and compassion, have helped me forgive myself for things in my life that I was unable to forgive myself for. They do blaze a trail. So I'd like to read you just this little quote. This is a psychotherapist in America called Michael Mead, who's run an amazing project called The Welcome Home, where they, invite, they invited soldiers to come and write poetry <coughs> about their experience and share that with the local community to help them find a way of connecting. So he, he describes a community based on welcome, the attempt to return. People need to be welcomed back and to be assisted to return and to find a place in the community. The warriors are supposed to get home. They are not supposed to remain in the war not left over there and not left out here. That's the tradition of all cultures, the honouring of the warriors, the welcoming them back and the return of them back into culture as meaningful and valuable citizens who know something about life and who know something about death and therefore they have wisdom. So I feel quite, I feel that that's the case. I feel they can have wisdom. I also have seen that the traumatic experience can be so strong that a person isn't able to find that treasure of wisdom that's, that's in them. So just moving on from this, um, oh, how do I do it, the clicker? I learned from Sunil, the, the Buddhist chaplain, these are the values that our soldiers are trained in, seed drills they call it, courage, discipline, respect for others, integrity, loyalty, and selfless service. Wouldn't it be lovely if we all and our governments practiced those values? I, I wonder if they would be sent to war, if we all managed that. And they're very hard to maintain under war conditions. Um, so from here, I'd like to say something about meeting the people who've come back from war. And what on earth is meditation like for them? So, this is Claude Anshin Thomas, who's a Vietnam veteran again. He's now become a Buddhist teacher and, and non-violence activist. You try carrying the baggage I was carrying around, and sitting still and quiet, it's meant to say. So, they come back with all this stuff. How can, how can we help them with meditation? So, well, the, the, the answer seems to be, that it doesn't work to avoid the pain. So people come back, they've probably been trained in the military by military culture to try alcohol first. So alcohol will dull the pain for a while. They try drugs, they try sex, they try workaholism. There's a lot of ways they bury it really deep down. Just let's not talk about it. I expect a lot of us have had grandfathers who just never talked about their experience. The Second World War is slightly different because it seemed like a very justified war and I think people came back less damaged in some ways because of their sense of the mor morality um, was stronger. But they didn't talk about it. They'd seen things, they just didn't talk about it. Nowadays we talk a little bit more. Um, but they come back and there isn't much of a culture of being able to tell the truth. So what we're trying to do with our project is to offer something that is beyond the quick fixes, beyond those addictive fixes which don't work. And we also, we don't promise a quick fix, we don't promise a cure, uh, we don't promise that those, those experiences are going to go away because they're not going to go away. What we've experienced in our life isn't, isn't going to go away. So, meditation can help us to just come home to recognise that our life is changed forever and to just learn a new relationship of being with that. So it starts with just relaxing. What we do initially is we just help people to relax. So we bring people into a group of veterans together. They feel safe with each other. It's really moving to see the understanding and the compassion that's between these guys. They understand each other's pain very well. Um, we, will, we will often lie down on the ground, we'll all just lie down 
will talk them through a relaxation of their whole body. Sometimes the tension that's been stored in their body from traumatic experience is such that their whole body will tremble, their legs will tremble, and, and there's a kind of release of physical energy that can come through when they start to be able to relax their body. Um, then there's, as I said, the hypervigilance aspect, being able to sort of relax and just say, okay, not everything is my responsibility now. I can just sit here, I can relax. It's not my job to deal with the noise outside the room. And then there's the whole process of emotional uh, healing, which takes a lot longer. And meditation and mindfulness helps us to just be able to sit with the pain and to come back to, okay, I'm here, I'm safe now, I'm with these people, I'm all right. And we, meditation helps us realise that we're much more than we thought we were. So I'm not just the person that made a huge mistake. I'm not just the person that did these things, that followed those orders, whatever it is that, we're, that they're carrying, that we're carrying. We can find a sense of our basic, natural, human goodness. And that begins to get stronger so that the nights where someone may wake up just thinking they don't want to carry on living, which does happen, and I've been there myself, I'm not going to have time to tell you that part of my story, but I fell in that hole between the beginning of this story and now um, through a, a loss of a child. Um, so I, yeah, I can't do that justice right now. But we begin to be able to find safety through meditations, find safety in our body, find safety in our mind, and begin to handle life in a different way. With mindfulness, there's choice. With awareness, there's choice. So now I want to say something about transformation. So I've, I've met quite a few veterans in the last year. It's a small project. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but I've met some amazingly impressive people. So I met some of them through Occupy London. So I'll just zip through this. We had an amazing alternative peace evening at Occupy London last November. This is just random Occupiers uh, and passers-by making a poppy banner in front of St Paul's Cathedral. This was what we had up all day. And we had an evening in which combat veterans gave a talk about their experience of war. They're very strong, you know. It takes a combat veteran to stand up there and say, people don't fall in war, they get shot in the face, they get blown up, they get crushed by a falling building, they burn to death. It takes a veteran to be able to say that, you know. I could say that as an anti-war protester, it's different. When someone says that who's changed their life through that experience, it has weight. So Ben Griffin, who's founded Veterans for Peace, he spoke. We made a remembrance wall there. This is an army veteran, young woman, who was involved in Remembrance Day in Occupy London. And, and we made a, a space where people could bring the names of their friends. There was a, a homeless tramp alcoholic I met there who told me his story from Northern Ireland. And, and I, he was so distressed by it that he couldn't actually write his friend's name on the on the wall, but I wrote it there for him. There's a lot of forgotten people, a lot of forgotten experiences. So Remembrance Day is so much bigger and deeper and more personal than, than we can often see it to be. Um, this is Mark, uh, an ex-Royal Marine who lost his leg in the Falklands War. So he's been through 20 years. He lost his leg at 20 years old. He went through workaholism, a bit of alcohol, a whole load of processes, a lot of anger, particularly towards the British government. Um, much more than towards his enemy. He's actually best friends with one of the most decorated Argentine um, veterans. So he's, he's talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. Is it all bad? Yes, it's very bad. It's complex, it's overload, it's suffering, but it can be a catalyst to learning. So I just have to tell you about Mark. He's now living in Canada. He's extremely interested in permaculture. He's been meditating a couple of years which has helped him deal with his physical pain. He's got a whole load of diagnosed conditions that he works with. You wouldn't know to look at him at all. Um, he, last time I spoke to him on the phone, he was learning beekeeping and how to tap the uh, maple trees for sap and learning from his elderly neighbours about making maple syrup. So this is someone who's really chosen to transform their life. And he actually said to me, you know, is there a silver lining? 
if I could wish that the things that had happened to me hadn't happened, would I? And he's not so sure anymore. But I think the thing is that we have to listen. My point with this project and my aim with this project is that we listen so that we don't have to keep repeating these mistakes for people to go through such journeys of transformation and not everyone makes it through a journey of transformation. That's the Buddha. Oh dear, friendship of the, is the whole of the spiritual life. I'll move on from that one. This, this is some of the veterans I've met at Occupy London. Um, this is Ben Griffin from Veterans for Peace. This is Michael Lyons who was imprisoned as a conscientious objector for nine months, I believe. Um, and that's Matthew Horn who used his military skills to totally whip Occupy London into shape, was the most organised person on site and was able to help everyone in terms of survival skills. They founded Veterans for Peace UK. Um, I went to their launch a few weeks ago, which was just the most moving thing. So Ben, particularly here, he's an ex SAS veteran. He left for his own ethical reasons, and over six years since leaving the forces, he's uh, founded Veterans for Peace, and he actually made a massive internal decision. He's a Catholic. Um, and he's made a massive internal decision. He realised that though he'd left behind war, he hadn't left behind the choice for violence in himself. And he made that choice. He said, he decided um, the option of violence is I'm taking it away from myself. I'm leaving it now. And he, he's now a non-violent advocate for peace. So quite a deep and extraordinary transformation that he's been through. He said that his reflections, when he realised that he was, as a trained killer, you know, an SAS trained man, to actually give up the choice of violence in his own mind was huge. He felt tremendously vulnerable when he made that choice. And he's come through it an amazingly strong person. So I'd just like to finish with a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Vietnamese... Buddhist uh, teacher and a peace activist. Um, and we'll finish with this final image. So, Veterans are the light at the tip of the candle, illuminating the way for the whole nation. If veterans can achieve awareness, transformation, understanding and peace, they can share with the rest of society the realities of war and they can teach us how to make peace with ourselves and each other, so we never have to use violence to resolve conflicts again. So that's all I can fit into this 20 minutes. I would just like to finish by saying, you know, obviously our big do aim is to communicate and to find a way that we don't have to have wars anymore. Our small do is, is to put reach out the hand of friendship to anyone coming home from the services and to say, you know, we're here for you and if you think meditation can help you, we're here and um, get in touch. Thank you.